today we're going to do something a little bit different. Today, instead of discussing current events or how crappy computers are now, I'd like to do something that no one asked for, but I think everyone would like for me to talk about. I'd like to discuss my history in computers and technology more generally. I was born sometime in the early 80s. I'd be what you would call a zennial. That is a uh, millennial that is very close to Generation X, which is people before 1980, uh, something like 65 to 80. But, uh, you know, generations are kind of a weird thing. The boundaries can be kind of sketchy. But I am a, an early millennial, otherwise known as a zennial. One of the hallmarks of a zennial is that we spent most of our childhoods with no internet and not much technology. The technology that we did have was very primitive by modern standards, but was far more accelerated than, say, stuff from the 60s. <clears throat> Where, in the past, there were these, uh, there were computers with storage on huge metal drums, computers that took up entire buildings, and then when they were miniaturized entire rooms, requiring special electrical transformers to send enough power to them to run them all, as they were all based on vacuum tubes, um, and then eventually in the 70s, the micro and mini computer uh, started using tape reels as the main form of mass storage. Hard drives were largely not a thing yet. Uh, I don't think floppies existed either. Tapes were pretty much where it was at. Uh, but, in general, tapes were the way that things worked. And that's kind of what happened before I came along. You know, tapes and terminals and graphics so primitive that... I mean, you, you didn't even have like true color available in any way, shape, or form. Um, 256 colors on a screen would have been just insanely expensive, beyond belief. In the early 80s, a 3D machine existed called the Foonly N1, or F1, that could render a juggler juggling, like, pyramids. Very primitive 3D, with just a, a, a small number of triangles, but could render 3D scenes, and it cost hundreds of thousands of dollars for this single computer that they made very few of. That is all the stuff immediately before I popped out and came into existence. In fact, the Commodore 64 came out several years before I did, if I recall correctly. It may not have been several years, but anyway, um, I don't remember the exact year it came out. But, my first computer was a Commodore 64 when I was three or four years old. The classic bread box, brownish, all-in-one keyboard that you plugged into a TV or monitor. Most people plugged it into the home television set. <coughs> when I was a kid, it was common to have a 1541 disk drive with your Commodore 64, but prior to my youth, um, the main mode of distributing software for the C64 tended to be data cassettes, normal audio tapes that put the software on the audio tape as a stream of beeps and blips. In fact, believe it or not, um, the data audio cassettes of the early 80s microcomputers, personal computers, home computers, the way that they stored data was pretty much the same as the way that you would send data over a modem, or you would send data over the airwaves if you were a ham radio operator and you were doing um, low data rate broadcasting. Um, you know, they, like uh, they, they used to have something called slow scan television that ham radio operators would do. <coughs> of course, now everything you, you've got access to 4K and 4K at 120 frames a second if you've got high end stuff. And all of this is but a distant, primitive memory. Uh, but yeah, data sets with the, uh, with the modem-style encoding of beeps and boops that just use different frequencies to encode different levels of data. And it sounds like, ah, when you listen to it back on a normal cassette player, because they were, in fact, normal cassettes. You could store data on normal audio cassettes. 
So tapes were the thing until about the mid 80s when disc drives started to really become affordable in, uh, in general for personal and home computers. I say personal computers, but let's be honest, when uh, I was a kid, there were computer labs full of Apple IIs. So yeah, there were plenty of personal computers in institutional use. Anyway, I grew up on a Commodore 64, and the only thing I knew how to do when I was three or four or five or whatever was load, quote, star, quote, comma, eight, comma, one, or just comma, eight for a very small number of things. Because the comma one had a meaning, and it meant that the uh, first two bytes of what you're loading are an offset to load the thing too. And if you didn't include the comma one, it would ignore those first two bytes. But if it, and most programs would have the first two bytes set to 0801 anyway, I'm, I'm getting a little off track. As a kid, I could put a floppy disk in the machine, turn the thing, and, you know, four or five years old, load, quote, star, quote, comma, eight, comma, one, enter, and then run whenever it said it was ready. <coughs> so I could play a bunch of video games when I was a kid. What did I play? Um, I played Raid on Bungling Bay. Um, there was a, one called Acrojet. Um, there was a helicopter game. I just can't remember the name of it. It wasn't Raid on Bungling Bay. Uh, it was something else. And God, I wish I could remember what game that was. Um, I, my grandfather, who is dead now, so good luck going after him for this, he, uh, over time, had gotten his hands on a bunch of pirate discs. Back in the day, you would exchange this stuff via bulletin board systems you'd dial up to, or just swap discs between people. So I had these pirate game discs. Of course, piracy wasn't really even a thing back then. Um, no one really called it pirating to speak of. Because, believe it or not, home recording wasn't really even a huge issue until the late 70s. So things like piracy weren't really that big of a concern at that point. Things like Betamax and VHS, yeah, that's late 70s technology. So I came out not that long after home videotaping became a big thing. In fact, people were still using record players in the 70s. Let's just be honest here. The technology has improved massively and the exponential rise of home recording and computer power and such really started to uh, blast off around the time I was born. Also, when I was born, the video game crash, um, you know, that had had its effects. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm, I'm just, I'm still getting over this sinus infection. Anyway, Commodore 64 could play video games. I had one game on a cassette, but a lot of other games. Now that I think about it, I think there was a, something called Cosmo Canyon. I don't know. Um, but some of the games I had were Atari ports. I had a disc that had um, Pac-Man, Zaxxon, Dig Dug, Congo Bongo, uh, Defender, Centipede, and I, I can't remember all the other ones right now. I really liked Zaxxon a lot. I do remember that. I had Jumpman and Jumpman Jr. Um, what are the games that I have? I don't remember. Anyway, it doesn't matter. I played a lot of games on the Commodore 64 when I was a kid. I had a Commodore 64 before I had an a Nintendo or Atari or anything. Um, when I was a kid, too, the kid next door got a Nintendo. The kid next door had Mario, Zelda, and Metroid. The kid next door played all this stuff, and I was jealous. I wanted a Nintendo so bad because, you know, it's like... At, I think I'm talking about like the mid to late 80s here. Yeah, late 80s. And Kid Next Door's got all this cool Nintendo stuff. And I'm looking at it, I'm like, wow, that's really awesome. Because let's be honest, there are some things about the Commodore 64, like the sound chip, that made the Nintendo look like hot garbage. But there are also some limitations to the Commodore 64 that made the Nintendo look pretty sweet. And... Nintendo's focus on everything being tile-based really gave it a leg up over the Commodore 64. Um, I don't want to go into the technical details, but just the number of sprites you could have and the, just the way that it worked in general, it was able to produce better looking games than the Commodore 64 in general. Um, there were some real weird quirks about the Commodore's video modes and the sound chip, for all its revolutionary awesomeness, one of the things it couldn't do was deliver um, 
pulse code modulation audio samples. So a lot of, um, especially later Nintendo games, started using samples for their drums instead of having the noise channel do the drums, which is just gives you that staticky sort of you would actually have drums, like you could do the, the tom drum or the snare drum or whatever, the kick, you know, you doom doom pew pew, you, instead of instead of just being clicks and scratches, it sounded like real drums, and a lot of games took advantage of that on the Nintendo. You couldn't do it on the Commodore 64 for a variety of reasons. So, yeah, yeah, seeing Metroid, which he, I never got to play as a kid, but um, just Mario by itself, I was just amazed. I was like, wow, this is amazing. I want this. And sure enough, around the time I was five, I got a Nintendo. And I played Nintendo for years. I didn't have Zelda, which was actually kind of a bummer. Other people I knew had Zelda. But I did get The Adventure of Link. Uh, arguably, I think I got the worst end of the deal on that. Because that, that game was so hard, I never got even close to finishing it. I never made it past Death Mountain. But anyway... <coughs> Commodore, Nintendo, and I actually stuck with the Commodore 64 for some time. So I used the Commodore 64, um, that's what I learned to program on because I picked up a manual when I was like seven or eight um, and learned to program in basic. And eventually, obviously, um, the Super Nintendo rolled around and I eventually got one of those. So, I grew up on a small set of Nintendo games and Super Nintendo games, and a large, a larger number of rentals and friends who had games that I could rarely play if I happened to be over there, and they weren't being stingy little turds. Boy, oh boy, do video game systems make children into stingy little turds. But anyway, the gaming's kind of a side channel there. The bottom line with the Commodore is that I had the Commodore for a long time as my main sort of access to computers and games. Um, I eventually got, let's see, I don't remember exactly, but it was probably around the time I was nine or so. <coughs> I got a, a used computer, I mean like a refurbished computer from my uncle, who is dead now, unfortunately. He drank too much, I think. but. Um, he worked for this tech company, and he had access, I mean, he was like me, you know, I have tons of computers, a lot of which are broken, but he had access to all this stuff, and all these old computers, so he refurbished one and gave it to me. It was an IBM XT compatible, now we're talking about, like, around 1990, 1991, 1992, I don't remember the year, but it's in early 90s. I got a, a, a PCXT compatible, a clone, with MS-DOS 3.3, two floppy drives, no hard drive, and a bunch of floppies to go with it. Um, I, I played a bunch of really old DOS games that were on some of those discs, and um, I learned a bunch of stuff. Like, I actually had the manuals to MS-DOS 3.3. So I learned all the commands at the old school DOS command line stuff. I read those manuals. I took the manuals to school and read them because I was just obsessed with this stuff. Computers were so fascinating to me as a child. Being autistic probably had a lot to do with that. Being autistic and other people not understanding me and treating me weirdly because autism's one of those things where people, they, they know that something's different about you, but it doesn't seem like... Uh, like, if you were retarded, like, you, you know, mentally deficient in an obvious way, people generally wouldn't pick on you or whatever, because, you know, we learned it was not nice to do that. But if you were autistic, you're not retarded, you're just weirdo. So, autistic kids uh, in the 80s and 90s especially, you, you, you kind of got used to being abused by other kids and uh, treated poorly by adults because they didn't understand you. They didn't care to understand you. They would not give you the grace of, uh, you know, making mistakes and figuring things out. So often interactions would, would end poorly because you're not right quick enough. And you're not retarded. It, back then, we literally used the word retarded like that. It was just normal. And it, it really should still be normal today, although mostly just as an insult because it's... <clears throat> we, we know a lot more about mental health and mental illness today than we did back then. But yeah, back then, retarded was where it was at. 
But if you were retarded, for the most part, people wouldn't pick on you because it's like, he's retarded. He doesn't know any better. Leave him alone. Other people would go out of their way to be like, hey, dude, no, just stop picking on the mentally ill kid that can't do anything about it. But if you were autistic, no, you were just a freak. So because of that, there was this tendency for human interaction to not really go all that well. And uh, thus, you would tend to just sort of go in instead of out. You wouldn't seek out people. Um, instead, I mean, it's autism. This guy's driving like shit. Oh my god, he's driving like shit. What's your rush, buddy? What's your rush? Come on. Come on, come on. What's your rush? So yeah. Enough of me trying to police assholes on the road. <sighs> what was I saying? Oh yeah, autism. You tend to sort of keep to yourself and, and computers... For someone who is autistic, especially high-functioning autistic, um, you would you would gravitate toward computers because computers don't judge you, computers don't care. But there's so much to explore. It's almost like a mental wonderland, if you will. Um, there were there was so much to learn, so many things. Like it's just fascinating. You can make this little box do things. Most people didn't care because most people are the type of people who just want to consume. They want to be entertained. They want other people to make entertainment for them, to make programs that do things for them, to make games to play, and they don't really care that much about making the hardware do something. They just want to be entertained. But instead of being entertained, um, you know, being able to program and, you know, having all this um, access to a computer and not much access to any actual friends. Um, I, and and on a, obviously having a hard time keeping friends because that's what you do when you're an autistic single-digit age kid. Um, it it was my life. Computers were my life, and they've been my life for a very long time. I don't really have to worry about a computer being a dickhead to me. Now I, I do have to worry about a computer making me angry because they're logical to a fault, and part of the problem is other people who create programs for you can do, make really stupid programs, but yeah. So anyway, falling into the wormhole of computers are interesting, um, other people are bad, typical autistic kid thing. And that's what I did. And, you know, a lot of other autistic kids do the same thing, except they go into art or, so, you know, some other creative field. Computers are a way to be both creative and technical. So, of course, you know, that's what I happen to like. Um, I think if computers didn't exist, I'd either be a mechanic or an artist. Um, and I've done both. So it's, it's not that, it's not that I have no interest in those things. It's just computers are sort of what I gravitated towards and never really, um, gravitated away from. So I had a DOS PC, two floppies, um, learned all kinds of stuff. There was all kinds of stuff I couldn't do because I did not have a hard drive to install anything to or copy anything to so it was just copying between floppies that's all you could do to shuffle things around I would write programs in GW basic not Q basic or quick basic mind you DOS 3.3 did not have these things Q basic and quick basic the graphical you know I didn't even have the full screen editor edit.com the only text editor was Edlin this stupid line based editor piece of crap that I hope to never use again. I feel the same way about X, EX, not the letter X, on uh, Linux systems that, you know, the, the thing that VI was born out of. Yeah, I don't care about line editors. They're stupid programs. They, they come from a time when mainframes couldn't afford a bunch of screens and keyboards and stuff um, the normal way, so they would have teletype machines. They'd literally have typewriter printers that served as the console and you would literally print lines to paper as you use the machine instead of a normal screen. <coughs> and, and I just, I don't, what's the point, dude? I have a screen. It's stupid. But this PC had 512 kilobytes of RAM. DOS 3.3 dated back to a time when IBM PCs 
Um, it's especially clones might have only come new with 64 or 128 kilobytes of RAM at the most. So I can understand some resource limited behavior, but for God's sake, by that time I'd already used SpeedScript, the uh, editor SpeedScript on the Commodore 64 for several years prior. And I'm like, on the Commodore 64, this like early 80s PC with 64K of RAM, and uh, you know, it's obviously a lot less space and capacity and processor power and everything. Why is it I can have a full screen, um, obviously no fonts or anything, but a full screen text editor on a Commodore 64, but they can't do it on MS-DOS from the same time period? Just honestly, a lot of my experiences with, with IBM PC compatibles um, especially back in the 80s and early 90s, really made me look at the Commodore 64 and go, why can't I just have that? But I didn't have the Commodore. Uh, my parents were never really together, and the Commodore was my mom's dad's thing. So um, he did eventually give, it, give the computer to her so I could have access to it when I was with her on the weekends. But at my dad's, I only had this stupid IBM PC. And... And it sucked. It was just, it was not great. CGA graphics, objectively inferior to the Commodore. <coughs> um, man, I, I really, <laughs> yeah, I wished I had EGA back then. But anyway, um, there were, there was just all kinds of stuff on there. But it was, even though it was a more powerful machine, it was a lot more primitive. So, but I spent a lot of time learning DOS and... You know, at other people's homes, I could tr occasionally do things like use Windows 3.1, or at school or at, at other people's homes, I could use the Apple Macintosh. You know, so I, and on the Commodore, I had GEOS, G-E-O-S, the Graphical Environment Operating System by Berkeley Softworks. Um, these things gave me access to graphical, um, graphical systems but I had no such thing on this IBM PC clone. So I've always been very far behind. I never got my hands on an Amiga despite desperately wishing I could. And uh, to this day, I've never, I don't think I've even touched an Amiga before. Which is sad because the, I, I, everything I've ever read and heard about it makes it just look like the most amazing machine. And I really wish that those scumbags that ran Commodore in the mid 90s and destroyed it, I wish they had never gotten hold of the company and destroyed it. Because if Commodore drove computers instead of IBM and Apple, can you imagine how great they'd be? Anyway, so it was IBM PCs with a Commodore on the side for a long time after that. I eventually was gifted a 386 from the same uncle which had Windows 3.1, so score one for that, at least I got a GUI now, right? Um, eventually I also was gifted an iOmega Zip 100 parallel port drive, which I could use, to, it was 100 megabytes I could take with me. It was the only thing I wanted for Christmas in like the mid 90s or whatever. But yeah, I, I was gifted this Zip drive and it basically became what an external hard drive is to anyone today that needs to shuffle data around. See, I didn't have any way to carry data other than floppies, but I had a lot more pictures and, you know, midis and stuff like that back then. Um, hang on, sketchy driving. And, uh, and so the Zip 100 became the place that I stored my stuff and took it to other homes, uh, you know, as the internet access became a thing. I was using that Zip 100, uh, I think even up into the 2000s, I was using the Zip 100 parallel port drive because um, flash drives still weren't a thing. Windows 98 didn't even have a universal USB mass storage driver. So, Windows 3.1 on a 386 in the attic, which was not climate controlled, so it would get hot and or cold, and boy do I mean cold, especially in the winter. Um, that attic, oh boy. But on that 386, I, I had access sporadically to the internet at an internet cafe in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and at other people's homes from time to time. So um, and I was able to download PaintShop Pro 3.11, 
and I started really uh, getting into image editing. I, I actually made a few interesting pictures using some of the brush tools and smudge tools and stuff like that. And, it, you know, I, I really got my image editing chops on PaintShop Pro 311. You can go download PaintShop Pro 3.12, and it still works on a modern Windows 10 PC. If you would like to see what I was working with, go get PaintShop Pro 3.12. Um, let me just put it this way. My, my video card did uh, 16 colors, but bare, or 256 colors, but barely. So I had to do everything in this dithered view, and it, it was rough. But, hey, man, I got it done. <coughs> anyway. 386 was um, where it was at for a long time, really. And when did I get something better? You know, now that I'm thinking about it, I think I got a 486. Um, I think I got my hands on a 486 PC because it was like a salvage in the late 90s. There was like a 486 salvage PC I got my hand on, maybe two of them. Um, I don't remember how I got them. I think that they may have been donated somewhere or I may have found them in the trash even because a 486 in the late 90s was kind of aging out and a lot of people were replacing them with Pentium 3s. Here I was with a 486, like, DX40 or 33 or something that I was installing Debian Linux 2.1 on. I think that was 1998, actually, or maybe 99, uh, from a CD that I got in a book that I don't even remember how I bought the damn book, but it was a $50 Linux book with Debian, Red Hat, and I think SUSE Linux. Um, on CDs in the book. I do not have the book anymore. But Debian Slink 2.1 on a 486. I compiled kernels for the first time. I, I seriously compiled software for the first time on this thing. And it, it was really hard, man. Learning Linux when, when you're a teen in the late 90s, I mean, that it was not easy. It's, it's like DOS on steroids, and I could see the power of it. But Linux uh, graphical environments actually were more bloated than Windows back then. Um, Windows 3.1 or 95 was honestly a better choice than GNOME on Linux or even KDE on Linux. Uh, and I didn't know anything about any lightweight stuff and there wasn't as much lightweight stuff back then. Linux was really um, still more of a specialty, you know, hobbyist OS. It wasn't the monster that it is today, although it was rapidly getting there thanks to Apache. So I grew up on that, um, on that, and eventually at, at the high school I took a computer class that I really didn't strictly need, but where we basically learn about how computers go together and build some that are going to be used in schools. Well, one of the things that happened is people would donate old computers to the school system as a tax write-off, and it would end up in the computer teacher's classroom. And they didn't really care what happened to him. They didn't track him or anything. It was just junk under a bench. And he would just, you know, I know he felt pity for me because he knew that I was autistic. Not like autistic, he didn't know that. But he knew that I really liked computers, didn't have a lot of access to stuff. Um, and he knew that, you know, I just, I, I had ancient hardware at home. And, and I actually would ask him, like, is there, you know, can I have some of that? <laughs> and for the most part, he would say no, but at some point, he actually did just, like, let me take computers home. He let me take a few computer things home. Um, I ended up with a Pentium 90, I think, out of that pile. And uh, that was my first Pentium. Uh, but we are talking, like, late 2000s, or late 1990s, early 2000s, somewhere in that range. Yeah, I think it was early 2000s. Um, so even by the... You know, by modern standards, a Pentium was a seven or eight year old computer. You know, people are throwing them away all the time. Um, business is replacing them. So I got a Pentium. And not long after that, I got out of high school, never went to college. Um, but I had a Pentium. I had Windows 95 at home for the first time, I believe. Um, no, the 486 is when I had 95, but now I had one that was actually pretty sweet. And. You know, I started getting internet access, dial-up internet access on a regular basis. I really started to explore things. Um, I'm actually running out of time. I'm almost not too far from where I need to be, so let's hurry this up. 
Um, early 2000s, uh, I, I was still running on old stuff. Um, I built my own, my first own computer in 2001 or 2002 or something like that. 2002, I'm guessing. Uh, maybe 03. But I built my first brand new computer for myself somewhere in the early 2000s. God, I wish I could remember. It was an AMD Duron, I think. Um, and I, I remember driving to the mountains to get one of those gateway destination monitors. It was like a 30, 36 inch or something. Um, computer monitor. Uh, I drove four hours to the North Carolina mountains to buy this thing and bring it home in a truck. It was super heavy and I didn't have it for that long. I actually ended up selling it because it was too much trouble. Um, and I just worked my way up through the ranks from there. But once I had built my first new computer for myself, it was kind of all downhill from there. You know how the story goes from there. I, I started a computer repair business on the side in like 2004, 2005. Uh, by 2007, it was my only business. It was the only thing I did, and it's been the only thing I've been doing ever since. You know, I've done a few side projects, but that's basically it. And with the computer business came enough money and access that I, I can get new computers for myself periodically. So I've kept up from there, but I spent most of my life just um, being behind, being seven, eight, ten years behind in hardware. And I think that a lot of my appreciation for like not not seeing old computers go to waste is I think about my childhood. I think about myself and I think about the access that I had to things that were like eight, nine, ten years old. But to me, they were new to me. They they were access to something great to me. And like who you know, it, it's almost like the uh, the starving kids in Africa thing to some extent. Like, who, um, who could be using this? Who could benefit from this the way I benefited from ten year old equipment when I was a kid? So that's sort of my thought process. Anyway, um, I'm gonna go to sheets down the road here, uh, but I'm just gonna cut this off. I think that that's a good enough of an overview of a ramble of my history. So I'm, I'm just going to be done. Um, thanks for watching. Like, comment, subscribe. Talk to you later.